thank you all for joining. Really appreciate you coming on here. I'm super happy to have Jack and Saul uh, to talk about some paid media trends that they're seeing and kind of across their clients and, and what they're actively trying to do to uh, stay ahead of the trend and, and make sure that their ad budget is going to good use. So just as a couple of housekeeping items, um, this will be recorded. So we'll make sure we send that out after. Um, the other side of that is at the end, if you do have questions and you want to populate those, feel free to send them our way. Um, we'll make sure that we, we answer any questions that, that you may have uh, at that point. So without further ado, what I'll do is I'll pass it over to Jack first. Maybe you just provide a quick intro um, in terms of kind of what you're doing at creation, kind of add some stuff that you're doing for your clients, and then we'll let Saul give an intro for that. Yeah, so um, Jack Kozakowski, so I'm the CEO of the U.S. Division of um, Creation Agency. Uh, we're a global uh, marketing agency that works with B2B tech companies. So we have clients from Google to IBM all the way down to smaller, you know, kind of startup clients. Leadzip is, we work with, do some work with Leadzip, and then, uh, you know, companies like Chorus. So we are in the weeds um, with paid media a lot, trying to figure out how do we drive more demand? How do we drive more leads um, to our B2B clients in a very, very crowded and noisy paid media space? Absolutely. And I'm sure with the recent events that are happening now, with a bunch of events being canceled, that media space is going to become even more um, crowded, if, if not more difficult to try and stay ahead. Uh, so definitely really, really key. Yeah. It's a great time to be in the agency world. I'm sure Saul would agree because <laughs> all the all the offline stuff that people are getting is no longer going to happen. So they're going to have to figure out how to get it all on their online. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're seeing trends in that too with the conversations that we're having. Uh, so that definitely makes sense. Now, Saul, maybe share a little bit about what you guys are up to at, at Point Blank. Sure. So we're based over here in Victoria, BC. Um, we work a lot with uh, B2C businesses, uh, e-commerce, and then um, B2B, mostly software companies. And um, over the years, we've, we have noticed that it goes a long way to have a, a, a strategy that's, um, you know, ahead of everyone else, especially on, on, on B2B, since the spaces are so limited and usually the uh, for us, uh, search search marketing is one of the things that we specialize on, and search marketing can get really expensive um, in in such a competitive environment where everyone tends to know what they're doing. <laughs> so uh, being being ahead of the curve and 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 having you know planting seeds early in in the customer journey can can help a lot, and that's kind of what we do over here at, at Point Blank. And uh, yeah, that's, cool. that's great. Um, so I know there's kind of six specific trends that we want to talk about, but before we dive into those, um, it'd be great just to get a kind of high level overview from you both in terms of what you're seeing uh, and maybe a little bit about what you look for when you, when you start to think of trends and when you start to pivot off of what you're currently doing. Jack, we can start with you. Yeah, so I would say there's the, the problem with paid media is that what worked yesterday doesn't work today. <laughs> um, and so what I'm seeing, you know, as far as trends is just the basics of doing paid media just like don't work anymore, right? You've got to really start to think outside of the box on, you know, what does your creative look like? Um, you know, how do you, how do you take something boring and make it interactive or engaging? Because, you know, the old way of like using stock, you know, photos and, and, the old way of doing paid media, like you just don't work anymore. Um, and then the other thing is really understanding the intricacies of not only the creative and the copy, we all kind of know that that's the basics of fundamentals of marketing, but is, you know, all the new bells and whistles and how do you use those to your competitive advantage? Because a lot of, you know, paid media people aren't doing anything but the basics, right? So I think there's a, there's a, there's a big area of paid media right now to mop up and understand these platforms at a very very deep level because they are innovating faster than most people can keep up so i think you know if you can keep up especially i mean b2b is a little bit more behind Saul's going to probably have a better you know take for b2c especially because the b2c stuff is getting really really innovative and moving forward a lot faster and very few people are keeping up there's a i think you know if you're a paid media specialist right now or you're or you're in the midst of doing that you're in a really good space right now because um, as crowded as it is, very few people actually know what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Saul, so, and 
Jack touched on kind of your B2C experience and, and that being more um, at the forefront of innovation, especially when it comes to paid media. But um, what, are you kind of, what do you look for when you're looking to identify new opportunities uh, in uh, things you can run for your clients? So um, I think that um, you guys already touched on a, on a very good point too in, in sense of um, what I, I think we forget a lot that, that we market a, a, a business that actually exists, whether it, if it's just online or, or it's brick and mortar. Um, we, we, we forget that what we're selling is not the, the, the ad, but the business and focusing on uh, to, keep, to keep ahead of the curve. I think that the main focus should be on the actual business and what the business does better. And then as you said, portraying that in, in a innovative way, whether it, and also um, that the place where the person has to finish that business, let, let's say a, a lead, uh, you know, a, a landing page for a lead or buying a product online, that final place where you're, you know, you're asking that person to trust you, that has to, that has to convey all the necessary information in, uh, as you said, non-boring, um, innovative way. And that's how we try to do business at Point Blank. Just try to, get at, try to get ahead of that curve by actually understanding the business, what they do, and putting that out in the most simple but entertaining way possible. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I think ultimately when, when you talk about that, right, it comes back to keeping the attention of uh, the folks that you have and doing that throughout um, that journey. And I think we'll talk a little bit about conversion optimization and some other things to kind of grab that attention, but you can't just stop there, right? Like you have a great ad that converts from whatever platform you're running it on. Ultimately, you still need them to take that next step, right? Whether it's submitting their credit card to buy a product or it's requesting a demo or whatever it may be. Uh, and that's, kind of, as you mentioned, kind of that attention throughout the, throughout the span. Uh, so with that, with that, uh, being said, why don't we jump into some of the trends that you guys are seeing uh, kind of across your clients, uh, Saul, and I'll pass it over to you, pass it over to you to kind of kick it off here uh, with what you're seeing across discovery ads uh, through YouTube and some of the other channels. Yeah, sure thing. And if you can just help me uh, with the slides, um, I'll just uh, um, go over this. So sure. one of the things that um, strikes us about or, or what we don't really think about in B2B is that the customer, like the customer actually does a lot of research uh, online and all of that research that makes that, that, that makes the customer journey quite long. Um, and we tend to think that, you know, the B2B person just, they, they know they need something and they look for it on tech search and they find it and they go and convert. And that's usually uh, not true. What happens is you have a very long customer journey, the same as in B2C and getting into that journey Early, early enough planting those seeds to help you convert in the long run. So one of the things like, for example, discovery ads, a lot of people would say, well, those are very consumer based and you can even see it here in the, in the, in the screenshots or, or the examples that Google provides a little bit. They, these are very consumer focused. Um, but if, um, if you're, for example, uh, a company that makes, uh, struts or, st or, or steel structures for buildings, prefab, those type of things, uh, and, and you sell them to construction companies, that these type of ads can still help you in, 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 in that journey and start you know, planting that seed early enough, that inception early enough, so that when the person is actually ready to convert and looking for your business or for someone that can solve their issue within the business world, uh, is you right? Um, if, if you're just there in the last step, and we see this a lot in B2B um, tech search campaigns, um, you're just there competing with other people that and bidding for keywords that are $45, $55, $70, uh, and which it's not always the, the, the best, right? Or it's not sustainable for a lot of businesses. So instead of that, you use uh, something like discovery ads on YouTube, on Gmail, uh, or on the Google search, um, search display, and you get those clicks for 30 cents, 20 cents, you get an email address, and then you market through your email, um, through your email list with nice creative, nice landing pages, 
something that actually will solve this person's problem when they need it solved, um, you're gonna have a way less cost per acquisition, uh, especially in the B2B business when it can be really pricey. And that is why we think that these new discovery ads, even though they, may, they might seem very consumer oriented, they can actually help uh, in B2B quite a bit. Well, I think, I think you bring up a good point too, is that um, in B2B, people are now searching for things online, right? Or on YouTube. Yeah. So it's like, hey, how do I um, set up a lead gen ad for Google PPC, right? Well, if you're a PPC technology and somebody Googles that, you need your ad to show up, right? Because essentially they might watch how to do something, but then they're going to click through to, feel, to, to find out which technology can service that easier for them. And I think most B2B companies don't show up when people are actually searching for something on the different channels, which is just mind boggling to me. Yeah, exactly. And then, it, and we're talking about search and, and you know, uh, that's something that's happening right now. We're still very query based for B2B, but Google is pushing more and more to use the, those artificial intelligences, right? So uh, a lot of the new creatives, new ads that are coming up for Google are switching from query to query list. So people are not even gonna, like Google is going, or, or, or Google is understanding what someone, either a, you know, a, a consumer or a business looking for a solution uh, is looking for. And, 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 and those, these ads are gonna start coming up more and more to people that are most likely to be using that product or that will be using that product in the future. So this is one of those ways of getting ahead of the curve now before everyone starts jumping in there. Um, so it's kind of, Google really wants to, and, and this is also competition between Google and Facebook, for example, uh, that Google and Facebook kind of, they, they both try to get into each other's fields and Google is trying to move from text-based into visual inspirations for people. They, they know that, for example, in shopping, shopping campaigns have a higher conversion rate for, than a text campaign for the same product. And it's just because there is a photo attached to the, to, to the to the to the result so um that is one of the reasons why we wanted to present the discovery ads and using them um they're already available they're available in 2020 and using them for um b2b campaigns over over the next year and just briefly before we jump to kind of the next trend that we're seeing so what type of content are people typically putting in i can understand it from um, a consumer standpoint and some of the examples that we have on the slide but when you talk about ultimately getting someone to a funnel, have you seen any or have you tried different content uh, and, and kind of what's worked for you in, in running these across B2B clients? Okay, so for example, um, as you said, you have, to write, you have to offer the right content in the right way at the right time. Uh, and as I said, one, one, one example of, this is the first, the first thought I, that I had because we've worked with, uh, as, uh, as I said, a strut uh, steel strut maker that sells to other construction companies, you know, prefab type thing. Uh, one of those things, uh, believe it or not, would be having um, having content that that portrays that product that so that that shows the prefab struts, the steel um, to the right audiences, right to those people in the construction business, um, and 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 the content it does. The content has to convey exactly what you're trying to solve and especially in the b2b business uh you can also do that on uh other type of solutions like um let's say b2b and and we're going to provide an example of this person later um it's not a super general example but it helps um business motivational speakers or business uh performance improvers those type of things those still can be used in the discovery um discovery ads uh, on YouTube, for example, uh, mm -hmm. clips of their presentations, clips of uh, some of their events, seminars, or even clips of their books, type, that type of uh, uh, creative can be utilized. But overall, Google lets you um, play with imagery, play with text, play with um, copy. Um, and even if you sell software, you can still show the attributes of your software as long as you, you know, portray it in a way that for that specific um, audience mm -hmm. is useful and lets them know that you're going to solve their problem. I think, I think the other thing is you could do like a how-to guide. So if somebody in B2B yep. is Googling something, or I'm sorry, looking for something on YouTube on how to do something, 
um, your ad should say, you know, complete guide to, um, you know, um, finding more targeted data, right? Or complete guide to helping you beat the out, beat the Google algorithm. Um, another route to go is free insights. So like, you know, for example, like LeadZip, you guys have, hey, get, get um, free account insights into your competitors' behaviors. So yeah. it's like, hey, you're signing up for something in free. We're gonna let you kind of see how this works now that you've watched a video on it. Here's a guide on how to do it and get a little bit deeper. So I think you just kind of match what the search term is with um, how to, and I'm always about how to do something, especially in those initial touches when it comes to paid media. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And it helps, I think it, there's a strong correlation with how to, and then eventually getting to that point where someone's willing to buy or ready to buy, especially in longer sales cycles. Um, but once you have I mean, that people, email, that email is like the direct response is, it, it's the best channel, right? It's the cheapest, most effective way for you to still acquire a customer. It's just a matter of getting them into that funnel. And I mean, people are on YouTube for two reasons, right? To be entertained or to learn something. <laughs> so um, if, you, you know, if you're in B2B, you're probably not gonna entertain them, um, but you can educate them, right? Absolutely, yeah, and I think that's, I, ideally you probably hit both, but like you said, B2B companies kind of suck at the entertainment part uh, yeah. so far. So, and cool. So why don't we, uh, oh, sorry. And, and just last, one last thing that I, I, I forgot to mention before, and talking about LeadSip that reminded me that, so, because we're moving from queries to queryless, uh, things like having customer match lists for email on Google, that can really go a long way uh, because these em this email lists will be the, the, the targeted audiences to which you can present your discovery ads. So, you know, these people are already looking for the type of service you're offering or the type of product that you are offering, but you're pre and you're presenting discovery ads, which are much, much cheaper than text ads. So right. things like customer match lists or email lists can go a long way in, in, in discovery ads, for example. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So next up on, and Jack, we can talk a little bit more about, I think this is a good intersection of creative and, uh, and content. So talk a little bit about what you're seeing from a video marketing standpoint um, and some of the trends in that area. So I'm going to keep this, you know, simple because we have a lot more slides, but I think the number one trend, and this has been a trend for a little bit, for a while, but I'm not very many people are capitalizing on it. So I'm going to bring it up again, um, is square video format um, and putting your text header at the top. As I kind of give you an example, um, you know, why sales teams need to get hit data and then your transcription at the bottom, just because a lot of people, you know, want to read uh, the ad now, right. Instead of hear it, especially if they're in like a, you know, a, a airport or something where it's loud and they don't want to bug people. They don't have their ear pods in. You want to make sure you have your transcription and then um, get really, really creative with your content. I think, you know, what a lot of companies do is they think they have to go have some like high production value content, right? Where they need to go pay somebody 10 to $20,000 to put some type of video together. That might be the case in some B2C, um, but in B2B, what I would tell you is, you can repurpose webinar content, right? So we'll repurpose this afterwards and, you know, try to figure out a way to, you know, drive this to free account insights. And then, you know, the numbers don't lie, right? Five to 10 more, uh, five to 10 X more engagement. Um, we're finding on square videos with text and transcription and three to five X more conversions. And that's across, you know, 17 different clients that we're running paid media for. It, it really never fails compared to just your kind of basic horizontal, um, content. And then the other thing is, you know, you can use this for paid media, but you can take that same and use it for organic across all of your channels, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, so forth. Yeah, no. And I think this is something, and whether you like Gary Vee or not, he talks about this a lot, right? And it doesn't have to be high production content that you're putting out. It can very much be repurposed stuff that you're already creating. And there's a lot of spinoff in a 30 minute webinar. You may have 10 to 15 clips that are ad worthy that could get someone catch their interest, uh, repurpose that. And as you mentioned, all of this structure um, certainly helps make sure that you're, you're catching all the attention. Cool. So Saul, maybe we can talk a little bit about it and just keep things moving along. Um, what we're seeing from a voice perspective. So voice is something and talking about Gary Vee, he talked about this a lot. I think he was kind of the first person that kind of put this on the map, um, at least from my perspective and hearing about it. But um, talk a little bit about what you're seeing. It seems to be, from what I've heard, 
largely uh, outside of North America. It seems to be a bigger trend that's happening kind of across the world. Hasn't had the adoption in North America, but maybe you've seen some numbers that disprove that theory. Yeah, sorry, I was muted here. So the the um, the numbers coming back for for voice searches are are increasing, right? Right now, seventy percent, as as the graph says, seventy percent of smartphone owners are interested in getting things done over a smartphone while they're driving, for example. So by speaking to it, uh, and and this doesn't even um, take into consideration the the new uh, you know home assistants like Alexa or or Google Home. Um, uh, and then 53% of smartphone owners are interested in sending a quick voice message or video, which it doesn't really uh, apply to us in B2B, but it just means that people are very active in, in this area uh, and, and of, on this way of using their smartphone. And uh, at the beginning, people also, it's, it's kind of um, the same as with the discovery ads. You, you might think that they're very consumer oriented, but for example, as you're, uh, voice commerce sales reach about 1.8 billion uh, in in the United States, and by 2022 they're uh, projected to reach about 40 billion. And those 40 billion, uh, trust me, they're not going to be all uh, business to consumer. 22% um, of U.S. Uh, smart speaker owners have purchased something using those devices. So that's the same thing. Uh, right now, still very B2C, but we're going to see that growing and growing, growing more. Uh, I know of a few offices in Victoria right now using Google Home uh, because it facilitates the, you know, uh, work around the office. Um, and, and, and that is the thing, right? About 20% of consumers have been, have made a purchase uh, through any, any of the, you know, voice assistants, uh, being it Amazon, being um, Google, Google Home uh, or any other. Um, and, and it just brings us to getting, again, um, getting ahead of the curve and planting those seeds early. So, for example, uh, a lot of people are using voice, voice ads or looking for information about upcoming events or activities, and that's very business to business. Uh, options to find new business information, uh, consumer service and support, which, I, I mean, it can generate some leads. Um, and... Uh, just going back to what we mentioned before, uh, personalized tips and information to make someone's life easier. So the how-tos that you guys were mentioning, that's one of the things that works really well with voice, uh, with voice ads. And that really um, is a play that can be used for uh, generating new leads. Um, then there's another one that's more, you know, consumer-based, you know, information about deals, sales, promotions, those are more into the B2C area. But all the other ones that I just mentioned are ways in which we can use the vo voice ads for um, planting those seeds early as well. Uh, especially because, as we said, like most of the research uh, for B2B um, purchases happen uh, online. And just so I, and I'm not familiar with how this translates, I, I don't have a Google Home, so I haven't been one of these people that have made a purchase. But uh, when, in a B2B context, hypothetically, would the experience be very similar to how to, um, let's say, book more meetings just as a simple and Google will spit back um, the highest rated result based on people's P uh, PBC ad spend? Or what is the process? How does Google define? Is it a separate campaign that you set up? Walk us through that process um, briefly. Uh, no, it is actually right now, it, it actually works within the same um, campaign set up as a keyword based text search campaign. So it is exactly as you said. So if we have a text search campaign based on how to, or let's say a person looking for a, a pizza place near their house, right? It's, it's the same like pizza near me. Uh, mm -hmm. It would be the same as how to close more sales. So yeah. that still, if you would have, if you, if you're doing it voice, uh, um, voice based on your on your cell phone or at your home in your home device the home device will spit out the, the ad that that's uh ranked first for example for you okay so it's very much i guess the balance or the thing you have to be aware of is having search parameters set up that are more voice how people talk versus how they may type which there might be some difference there to be optimized for voice is that the core aspect of things yes i i think i would separate like I wouldn't run them together. I wouldn't run a text-based 
a text search campaign with a voice campaign together. I will run them separate and then monitor performance for both of them differently. Cool. Okay, perfect. Now, Jack, I know you do, you don't just do social, so you do touch on Google a bit uh, and you have some, some things that you're seeing kind of across Google ad lead forms. Elaborate a little bit on that for us. Yeah, not everybody has this um, from what I understand, but you, most people will start to get access to this. Um, and that is Google ad lead forms. And so I think, you know, one of the struggles in B2B, which most uh, marketers struggle to do is to build their email list, right? So they might drive a ton of traffic from Google um, and they're paying for that traffic, right? Um, paying for those clicks and they might drive a ton of traffic, but maybe their conversion rates are low. And a lot of times that's because they have a crappy landing page or, you know, the offer on that landing page is not good. So I think one of the things that Google ad lead forms does is it kind of eliminates having to have the perfect landing page where some marketers struggle, they might have the resources and you know, you can just actually get people to sign up right inside of the lead form. And anytime you can reduce the friction, I think anybody in paid media understands this, the less friction um, to, to get somebody to do something, the easier it is to get new leads. So mm. I'm really interested to see how this works. I, um, you know, we don't have access yet, but I know that we have a lot of clients that as soon as we got we get access to this, we will obviously take full advantage of it. But it's something to really stay ahead of the curve and you know, you're not gonna see a lot of marketers even know that it exists, to be fair. Now, and this is something that across LinkedIn, for example, especially in a B2B context is kind of uh, hit by storm. And I, I see those come up and looking just in the back of our ad campaigns. When you're running a campaign with a lead form, do you find the conversion drops? Uh, or do you actually find it higher and the cost per lead is kind of comparable and where you want it to be to actually driving someone to your page? So I can only speak from a Facebook ads perspective um, and um, LinkedIn. The lead gen forms always convert higher at a lower cost per lead. The problem that we see is the quality of the lead. Okay. Um, and the reason being is because Facebook, a lot of times, somebody's using the, an email address that they don't even know that, you know, like their Hotmail account. So it does, you know, Facebook, I know that we've seen some crappy lead quality using the lead gen form because it pre-populates what they have in their account. And that's usually just crap data. <laughs> um, now LinkedIn's a little bit different because you can actually force up a, a, a company email. So we do see on LinkedIn using the lead gen forms drives down your, your, your costs tremendously. Um, but, you know, with Google ad lead forms, we haven't really been able to test. So I can't really give you the numbers, but I can tell you that the numbers will probably be good. I think the only thing we'll struggle with, like I said, is if it, if it won't force them to use, um, especially if you're doing B2B, an actual company email address. We'll, we'll see how that works. Yeah. And, and that's, I think, a challenge on any platform that isn't B2B focused, right? Because it's optimized for likely B2C just based on the amount of money that, money that is spent there on a consumer basis. So um, that is, I, hopefully they're able to figure that out, but I can see that certainly being being a challenge. Now, so maybe we can, we can shift over to the conversion optimization. So I think a core theme here along with trends is making sure that you have compelling content, number one, to engage people, but then ultimately on that landing page so that you're converting the traffic that you are generating from your paid media spend. Um, so maybe tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing uh, and some of the results that you've had from a conversion optimization standpoint. Oh, you're on mute. There you, there you go. Um, so we've been talking a lot about how to get people to your offer or how to get people's attention. Um, but then what happens when, when we, we have that attention, right? And um, you guys were just mentioning, you know, people that may have a crappy landing page and using your, you know, Facebook leads or LinkedIn leads because they don't really have a, or they don't trust or they haven't had any success with their website. Um, and in the past I have, had to use that strategy for some clients while there's some like you know housekeeping um done in the background or you know fixing their website and i just wanted to use this example uh, and and i do see this a lot uh, and it happens both with you know b2c or b2b businesses um it doesn't matter the size sometimes when websites are first created they're created um even though they're meant to be for a business, they're created with, um, I, I almost call, call them vanity sites, and they're created to show how amazing the business is from the business perspective or from the person's perspective. And it doesn't really have 
any information about the actual problems the business will solve for you uh, in, in a coherent, quick, easily digestible way. Um, and, and that loses people and people, people you, you know, everyone knows that cliche, right? You have two seconds for, for, for their attention. And once they, once, once they, once they are bored or, or they don't think they're going to find what they were looking for uh, with you, they, they leave and they look somewhere else. Um, I wanted to show this example from one of our clients just because uh, as a lot of uh, those websites uh, in the in the late 2000s, uh, mid 2000s, this website had a huge video hero banner uh, on uh, just above the fold, uh, with no you know no call to action, no description of services, a little that little menu that you see there that was uh, all the information that the website said, and the whole screen that you see right now screenshotted. That was a, a, a video. And I, I mean, the video, uh, going back to our conversation in the beginning, yeah, it wasn't boring uh, if you like rowing. <laughs> but if you're a person that's look at um, the, the context of this person is this person who won a gold medal at the Olympics, and now he's a motivational speaker. Uh, he's got great stories to tell. He's got good services. He, he has a, a good way of telling them in different, you know, types of services, as you can see, you know, keynotes, workshops, executive coaching, uh, but none of that was conveyed. It was just a big guy getting a boat in a winter day in the West Coast. And, and that was it, right? So a lot, of, a lot of questions were left unanswered. And just by, you know, and, and this is something that you can take from, from this webinar is um, by uh, organizing everything um, in you know, nuggets of problem solving. This is how we solve the problems. This is what we give uh, as a service or a product. And, and, and then once you divide those, give, a pers give the person a, a, a very understandable uh, call to action, it will increase your conversion rate uh, in, in, in quite a substantial, substantial way. So that side that I just showed you guys, once we made this switch from a vanity side to a converting side, uh, the conversion rate for paid traffic, especially, went from 1% to 2.5% uh, year over year just by switching the website. We didn't change anything else. We just changed the homepage. Uh, and the overall conversion rate for the entire site went from 25 to 3.6%. So that's just a quick example of how you can, you know, um, improve uh, the number of leads that you get. And, and with that, the more leads that you have, the more business you're going to close right so um and that example is just one of several that we've seen over the years uh in which just compartmentalizing com compartmentalizing the the way that uh you solve people's problems and and then having a clear call to action on how to get in touch with you would will go a long way for for people especially if you're spending money on on pay-per-click yeah and it, just just to be clear that's a specific landing page you have that you're driving traffic to based on specific search intent that's happened or that you've deemed to be important and it's coming there, coming there directly. Um, and you know that that next action you want them to take is to contact Adam and, and engage in a conversation. Exactly. So that, that, that specific, so that is the homepage of, our, of we send people there for, uh, you know, as broad, broad queries as, you know, just motivational speakers. Okay. So, yeah. Very good. Cool. Um, so, why don't we kind of shift Jack and we can talk to talk to you about or talk about spin on my words here, but uh, talk about third party intent and how you've used it across local like audiences uh, and, and kind of the results that you're seeing with with the data that you're that you're populating. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I mean, I hope by now most paid media marketers understand the data drives everything, right? I mean, no matter how good your ad is, I'll give you an example, like Mike Bloomberg, I don't know if you guys, uh, people know who he was, but the guy just spent $750 million on ads and didn't get like but maybe two delegates, right? So uh, no matter how, how much money you spend on ads or how much traffic you drive or eyeballs, if your offer is bad, right? And that, you know, it's, you don't have the right audience, you're not gonna get much out of it. So one of the things that, um, other people should realize is, you know, if whether you like Trump or you hate him, you know, you have the fa best Facebook ads team that ever lived, right? I mean, you've got a guy that they understood data. And so what they did was essentially they looked at behavioral data. 
Um, there's multiple sources you could do that. Obviously, lead sift is one that we like to use. You know, no no plug there, right? Um, but essentially, you know, people that are looking to buy what you might have to offer. And this used to be just a B2C play, but now this is a huge B2B play with all the research that people are doing, you know, months before they even get on the phone with the salesperson. So if you can identify that, and, and there's multiple ways to do that, right? Through their search intent, um, through their social behaviors, through their interactions with competitors, um, you really have to kind of get creative in the way that you let an algorithm like LeadSift or other you know, solutions like this, the way that you let them think and let them work. But I think where, if, if you don't have a huge list, your own email list, which a lot of B2B companies don't, you know, you should be making it look like audience of that, but then you have all this other data that's behavioral intent that you can use to let Facebook's algorithm or LinkedIn's algorithm actually do a lookalike of that intent data. So if you can figure this out, it's a really, really powerful thing and your conversions will go up. And, you know, if you can mirror that with really good copy to that targeted audience and really good creative, you're, you know, you're even better. Here's an example of one of the lookalike audiences we did was, um, you know, it was buyer intent based on people that were looking at marketing automation platforms because we as an agency help companies with their marketing automation, whether that's like HubSpot or Pardot. So we actually took a lookalike audience of bunches, uh, a bunch of different people that were showing that they were either engaging with Pardot or HubSpot, um, doing all these different behavioral activities that we thought would be signs of, uh, of somebody wanting to buy. And then we went in and made a lookalike audience and look at Facebook gave us 2.1 million people that they thought looked like those people so that we could run ads in front of them. Um, I don't think it gets more powerful than that from a data perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the challenge is always the size and you kind of alluded to that here, right? And making sure that you have a big enough audience to target. Um, I know in some experiences when you have a small audience and you mentioned an email list, um, the cost can be quite high associated with getting the attention of those people. Uh, so any kind of external data sources help boost that, right? Yeah, I think the problem that most people would have like when they get a buyer intent or third party is they might upload the list of 2100, um, you know, that they got from, you know, say that they, they've got an algorithm going and it only gave them 2100 people for a seven day period. And they put that 2100 people into Facebook and only like, you know, 150 match because they, the people were using like a B2C address instead of their company. You know, what this does allow you to do is to take that buyer intent data and actually open up a bigger pool of people that the platforms say look like those 2,100 people or the 100 that matched. And that's where a lot of companies and paid media marketers go wrong is they look at buyer intent data and they don't understand that, you know, that data can be, there can, you can create lookalikes of that data and let the, the smart AI algorithms from the other the social platforms find people that look like that for you using that data. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a great point. And those attributes that they have are going to be quite a bit different than the intent data that you're getting and you can match across a lot of those. So um, building out that audience becomes a lot easier. Awesome. And, and so uh, you mentioned this a little bit, but uh, in, in one of the previous uh, trends that you were seeing, but have you guys tried using intent across Google uh, and adding some custom match audiences in there and has it provided uh, benefit for you? Yes, uh, we actually, so um, uh, to give you an example, we have used them with a few software companies, uh, customer match um, lists that actually you guys provided to us. And uh, we, we have actually been quite successful with them. Um, it, and and now, nowadays we're, we're looking into using them with B2C as well. Uh, but our most of our customer match success has been in the business to business world, which will be different to what we've been talking about. Uh, this, this, is, this is a trend that kind of originated for us, at least uh, first in the B2B, into the B2B area. Um, it, it does work. It does provide good leads uh, just because people are looking for a solution uh, to their problems as I keep reiterating. And usually it doesn't, especially in the B2B world, there's, no, there's less brand loyalty, right? Um, when you're looking for a solution, it's probably because you don't have a provider yet for that solution. Uh, there are people that, you know, they've worked with IBM forever, uh, but um, there are new things 
coming up that people start creating. Uh, let's say, for example, one of one of the uh, people that we know in common, certainly software, uh, they provide lists, right? Uh, checklists online that are for ISO um, uh, certifications and those type of things, ISO certifications, and. Uh, it doesn't really matter for when, when a people when a when a business wants uh, this automated and 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 they don't want to keep using paper and they want all of this uploaded to you know a central um, computer where they can just you know get everything together for their certification. They don't really need uh, or or they don't have someone that's their go-to because this is a sort of a newer service. So they will go to whomever solves their problem in the most economical way and in the most efficient way. Um, and, and it not necessarily has to be, you know, brand loyalty it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be, you know, a person that might love Nikes for, for their, um, for, for their runners, but that's a, that's a consumer thing. And brand loyalty, I think works more, uh, in that area, uh, in the B2C side, I think, uh, money talks, right. And if you're going to solve a problem and you're going to solve it efficiently and in, in, in a, a uh, most cost efficient way, uh, you're going to get that business. Cool. Now, and I do want to be conscious of time. I know we're coming up to the end, but um, for the folks that are here, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to populate them. Um, otherwise, we can we can wrap up just with the key takeaways. But I'll give you kind of thirty seconds uh, if there's any questions that that you have. So. Um, one of the questions that I have for Saul is, what is the major difference between how you set up a B2C ad versus a B2B ad? Um, you know, what are, the, what are the major differences in how you set those up? Well, it always depends uh, on the platform, right? The channel, if we're just talking Google, for example, um, a, a B2C ad is, uh, I, it's, it, it's all about the copy. In, 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 in tech search, um, a, a B2C ad, uh, I, although it does talk about, you know, uh, the product features, it also talks about all the, how easy it is for the person to receive that product. Uh, the, pro the person that is already looking for this is usually trying to get that product the fastest way possible or the cheapest way possible. Um, and, and those type of things really go a long way. Uh, for the B2C set of things. For B2B, I, I, I think it goes back to like, am I gonna solve your problem? Um, this is how we do it. And, and, and um, more, as you, I would say that you see a lot more like incentive based type of uh, messaging and copy, you know, versus B2C versus B2B, you know, um, get 10% off, 20% off, or try yeah. this for free, free shipping. Um, and I, I always see that that's kind of the major difference between the way, you know, B2B ads, you're not doing that. You're trying to set, like add some type of value um, that's usually not a discount because you can't yeah. you know, get position like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's kind of, um, that's sort of what I was trying to go at the end there. Uh, you're 100% you're right. You're trying to, you're trying to portray you know, the benefits of your product without giving, giving the value of what you're giving the business without having to give the uh, you know, a discount or free shipping that type of thing because a lot of the times you don't even ship anything. So, so we do have one question, um, and then I think we'll we'll wrap it up. But um, and this is to both of you: if you had one channel, you're running a B two B campaign, um, you could pick one channel to to go after. Um, what would you do if you had to start today? What would you do to get the ultimate uh, results for your client? What what channel would you bet on? Oh man, that's tough. Um, it just depends. Um, so like if you're running a freemium SaaS model, um, it's going to be completely different than if you're running kind of like, uh, you know, a longer sales cycle, you know, it comes down to the sales cycle or the cost, right? I mean, if it's a $10 widget um, SaaS product monthly with a free premium trial, I would say, I would, ooh, that's tough. Um, <laughs> uh, I would say, Probably Facebook, um, just because it would be the lowest cost for like something that had a premium type of model where somebody didn't have to put in their credit card. Um, but if it was something that you had to put in your credit card for, 
Um, I like the search base more. So I usually would test Google first um, just because I want somebody that's searching for something, right? If they're going to put in a credit card. I don't want to just be um, showing them something for the first time in a LinkedIn ad or a Facebook ad. I want that they actually type that in because that was what they were looking for. And I know that those are the people that are going to put in the credit card the fastest, most likely. But, you know, then again, if just it turns out, determined by the search amount of how many times somebody searches something, if you have a product where nobody searches it, you don't, you, you know, putting it into Google is not going to do you any good. So it does, you know, it's kind of a tough question to answer. But, um, you know, my go to is always Facebook first um, to test. Fair. And so if you, if you had one channel, uh, what would it be? Would it be Google or would you go somewhere else? Um, <laughs> I hate giving answers that say like, well, it depends. Uh, but um, I, I, I do think that the first, for B2B, the first place that I would try something would be uh, Google. But uh, a lot of people, and I've had this from, from a few businesses I have, we have given the option of Facebook, not LinkedIn, but Facebook for B2B sales or B2B mm -hmm. advertising uh, because of the difference in pricing between Facebook and LinkedIn. I found that it's cheaper to advertise on Facebook and generally it's the same people. They just, they're just in a different platform. Uh, uh, and in my opinion, we do do ads on LinkedIn, but in my opinion, a lot of people on LinkedIn, um, are, uh, are a little bit into the, they're a little cynical. Uh, they, they always expect they're being sold by someone else. Uh, while on Facebook, even though they're being sold all the time, um, there is that ludic component to it. And sometimes if, as I said, if you're there at the right time in the right moment with the right creative, um, that person that might not be at, or they might even be at work playing on Facebook, but, um, they're not, working um you might be the solution that they had been thinking about for the last three days right right and now you you, you came up on their facebook feed and I'm like oh well facebook is listening to me well okay, yes and <laughs> second uh you, you can be the, the the right person at the right time so well i would say linkedin is like super expensive so unless you've got a big deal size yeah. Um, it's a very expensive platform to do lead gen from. So you mm. really kind of have to outweigh like what your CAC is, yeah. your customer acquisition yeah. costs, and what your lifetime value of your customer is. Um, but you know, if you got a if you've got a deal size of 10k for the year or more, um, you know, it's worth it to spend 50 to 100 bucks to get a lead from you know LinkedIn. If you don't, um, if you've got a you know nine dollar ninety nine cent product, it's 120 dollar. Right. You know, LTV for the year, you're probably not going to want to go spend a hundred dollars to acquire. Uh, so, you know, you kind of have to look at your deal size for like a LinkedIn, Facebook, you know, is a little bit cheaper, but the quality is a little bit less. And then Google can be cheaper or more expensive depending on it. So you kind of have to weigh it out for each product. I haven't found any, there's one size fits all when it comes to paid media yet. Yeah. Uh, I just said, you know, every, every client's different. Yeah, no, that's fair. Cool. Well, Thank you both for spending some time with us. Um, hopefully the audience, you got some good takeaways here from the trends. Uh, we will send out the recording. So if there's anything that you felt like when you're taking notes, you missed, we'll, we'll make sure we get that to you. Um, but again, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Jack and Saul, this is great. Thanks thank guys. You guys.